there and recognize that we'll make mistakes sometimes. So. Yeah, and I'm Deja Moore. Um, my pronouns are she or hers. And I'm also at CDPHE, and I'm the Comprehensive Human Sexuality Education Program Coordinator. So we call it CHEESE for short. Um, but yeah, I'm a trans woman of color, um, and I really think it's important to ensure that our experiences are heard um, because they are traditionally left out of the table. And so that's my expertise tonight in bringing that to the table and forefront. Awesome. So we thought we'd just take a moment and have everyone um, just kind of share your name, um, pronouns if you feel comfortable, and then sort of what's one thing you're hoping to walk away with tonight? So anyone want to start? Awesome. Hi, my name is Alicia Michelson. I use she, her pronouns, and I am eager to learn. And so I'm excited to watch her with some new knowledge and information. Hi, my name is Amanda, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm really interested in seeing how this information translates to our community in a broader way. Um, these are things that the Learning Council has been striving for for a little while and trying to implement. And we're really excited that we have like a growing, strong coalition of people who are all interested. So thanks everyone for being here. I'm excited to just see how it all goes. Um, I use he, him pronouns and I'm just excited to like hear about the scholarships, I guess. And also like how this can make our community grow and be better. Well, sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Pat, and um, what, 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 how would you say? <laughs> sorry, Pat. Pronouns, <laughs> like something you'd like to get out of me. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm she, her, um, and let's see. I would like to tonight to have more illumination about how we as a community can um, politely but firmly um, require our elected officials to be transparent and responsive to us about their decisions around equity and inclusion. Specifically, I'm speaking about the school board. And there's a school board member too. We have some Zoom. Zoom. So we do have some representatives. Yeah. I felt last night like there was some kind of a growing feeling in me that it's a little known fact that our school board of five people, only two of them are elected, and the other three are appointed. And I want more information about that. How that happened, who appointed them, why their terms are as lengthy as they are, who they represent as appointed members of a school board, et cetera. Hi, I'm Raven Chiefer, and I am a small business owner in town and also interested in my town being more inclusive. Um, and and how I can do that as a small business owner. And I have a child growing up here. How can I bring that to the youth as well, through the, the school that I interact with through my child? And um, I'm really excited for this training. So Yay. thank you for bringing it. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Mike, um, he, him, and uh, I also have a, a child, same child, growing up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, want to educate, educate him as he grows. Uh, I'm also a small business owner, and I want to learn um, how to act with intention in this space um, toward productive ends and, and helpful ends to the community of the Hi, I'm Julia Schlosser. I'm the new instructor at Technical College of the Rockies. And I want to, you know, like I said, an important word with intention, incorporate these principles into my classroom. I feel that I, I'm kind of naturally that way or have learned to be that way, especially living in the Bay Area for nine years. And uh, I just want to make sure that I'm more intentional about 
bringing it to my space in the classroom. Hi, uh, I'm Marilee, and I am a, um, also a small business owner and um, direct the community theater programs and have been a teacher here in Vanya for 20 something years. And so um, I'm really psyched to that you're here and just want to learn more how to be a better ally, how to look inside myself for whatever's there to, you know, whatever's there that's holding me back from living my fullest life and supporting our choosing. Hi, I'm Amy Peterson. I've been a board member of the business community since 1992. I've seen a lot of changes. Less from my high hair views and more <laughs> color and things now. <laughs> but um, I work at the, the New Northport High School. That's my upcoming job. I've been in the school district for quite a bit. And I'm uh, an ally for LGBTQIA plus students, faculty, parents. And also special education students, faculty and parents, not faculty and parents. So anyway, I just want to learn more about everything that I can to, to be a better support system for anybody that needs it. And I'm open to correction. If anybody, if I ever say anything that doesn't fit somebody right, please feel free to correct me. And I do use she and her pronouns. I'm Joe Edmondson, I'm also a small business owner in the community for about 20 years. I've been here for about 20 years. My two kids went through from beginning to end, um, and they're both of uh, indigenous backgrounds, so I had some interesting experiences with them both. And I just want to learn to learn as much as I can so I'm a better leader in business, and also just I want to see this community come together about this subject. And so I hope it. It's expanding. Uh, my name's Josh. I'm a pastor uh, here in the North Fork Valley. Uh, and uh, I do uh, intentional uh, action uh, uh, ally in uh, uh, advocates. My name is Lissandra. Uh, she, hers. I'm, uh, I'm also a small business owner and I would love to learn more uh, about how to continue to be equitable amongst uh, our staff and the customers that we serve over the internet all over the world. Uh, and in particular for myself, I would like to uh, learn how to maintain inclusivity and contact and comfort. My name is Steve. Um, he here. Um, I'm a small business owner. Um, been in Delta County for 30 years. Um, I'm really interested in, at least theoretically, um, knowing how to bring more diversity into our community. This is what I, I really like to, to know about. My name's Kristen O'Brien. She, her, and I'm the director of campus and hands on at Solar Energy International. And we bring five or six hundred students to PAM every year to learn about solar energy. And I feel personal responsibility to make our community a more inclusive place for students, staff, and instructors that we bring here. And I'm really particularly interested in how we can create systems of accountability on campus um, and in our organization for um, when someone is hurt. So. Uh, my name is Bruna Anna. I need she, her pronouns. Um, I work at Hackington News Magazine here in Tanya. And so this is a conversation that we've been having a lot like about how it applies to us nationally as like a national publication that covers the West. And so I'm really eager in this training to think specifically about how to apply it to Delta County and to Tanya. Hello, I'm Carolina Flores. I'm the director of the Hackington News Studios. And we bring artists from all over the world to spend time here in the small community and create art. So, something with Kristen, um, just thinking about that context of bringing artists from all over the world here 
um, and being a better support system for artists of color and for artists to come and feel safe within our community. Um, and so I'm really excited to learn how to do that in my own work and also personally to be able to see the community here that we all can see. I probably the right to me, but it's not entirely decided on that. Uh, I guess I identify as a lesbian. And coming from a background of gender, sexuality, and women's studies with a focus on intersectional feminism, it's been a while. So this is the first event in quite a, some time that I've attended as I transitioned into my graduate program at Naroka. Um, and I will be teaching uh, creative writing. So it's good to brush up on the lingo and the energy of these spaces um, that I want to navigate most of my life. But it's just, I think, a long space. And I'm in Cannes in February for the next month until I go back to the Um, Hi, I'm Mila. I use the event pronouns. Um, I work a lot with youth. Um, we move the High Desert Center, which is a gap year organization, and we bring uh, students from also all over the country here. And um, and also currently I'm working with the Nature Connection in Hotchkiss, uh, doing summer programming for their camps for kids. Um, so I think that my desire to take away from this is specifically how can I be bringing this into conversations um, with younger people and how can I really be um, modeling this kind, these kinds of conversations and these kinds of, this kind of thoughtfulness with people who maybe are not getting that from their own houses um, or their own communities. So that's what's most important to me. My name is Marion, and I am one of the directors of the High Desert Center, which runs gap year programs for people all over the world now. Um, and um, I use she, her pronouns. I am interested in um, how to facilitate challenging conversations, as well as like how to encourage having those challenging conversations because. I think a lot of times, especially when it's like a predominantly white space, we tend to avoid. And I think that, that that's something I'd like to become more comfortable in encouraging and creating. Um, <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Blake uh, B. Him, and I also work for High Desert Center. And, um, and yeah, feel. That it's important to add to this work in terms of working with young people, but also uh, being a member of this community. I'm Justin, uh, he, him. I also work with these folks at the High Desert Center in the Nature Connection as well, do the summer programming in Delta. And I'm here just to listen, try to learn something. Awesome. And we do have a chat in, if I could read that really quick. We've got Heidi Marlin, who was one of our speakers last night. And Heidi Marlin, she, her pronouns. This is my first DEI training. Excited my work is doing a DEI training August 4th. Just found out yesterday. Yay, indeed. Anyone else online for introduction? Um, if anyone else wants to chat in, I can read for you. If not, we'll continue. So part of the reason we did this is because equity, oppression, DEI, white supremacy, it's so much content. Um, and realistically, every single slide we have in our presentation could have a full hour dedicated to it on its own. Um, so we'll move kind of quickly and, and to some degree surface level, but I think the opportunity is to kind of explore what pieces of these are things that you'd be interested in kind of learning more around and, and having more uh, opportunity. So, Candidly, we may not get into specifics around facilitating challenging conversations, but hopefully it's starting a conversation around sort of what could be infrastructure and sort of how do you start some of those and create safe spaces to be able to have some of these conversations. 
Um, but hopefully we'll be able to speak to a lot of this other piece and kind of give some motivation around the systems of accountability that several of you spoke about. Um, so we wanted to start, we did this yesterday too, before the, the panel conversation around ground, ground rules or group norms, I, I like to use too. Um, and these were just some that we kind of thought through now. Um, and Asia, do you want to walk through some of those? And then we wanted to hear from you all if you felt like you're taking this in or that you would want in this space as a group norm as we engage in some of these conversations. Yeah, so there is basically uh, five main tenets. So one, just being a willing to listen. I think that's so important, right? If we, we can't even have these conversations if we're not willing to listen to each other. Um, another one is maybe um, work towards challenging your thinking. So the biases that you come into this uh, event with or just some of the thoughts that you have, be open to kind of challenging your, your thought processes and what you've learned. And that goes also with taught behaviors. We all have been taught certain behaviors, attitudes, and emotions but really trying to think differently um, as we kind of work towards Jedi. Uh, respect is so important. Uh, we can't have these conversations without respect and just an opportunity to listen with um, each other. Uh, we ask that you all don't uh, put each other down with language, uh, really try to be inclusive, just because this is a safe space. Um, we, we have a mantra too that like what happens in Vegas, like stays in Vegas. So basically here, what happens here stays here. Um, I'm just creating that same space. And then last two, um, we ask that folks don't misgender folks. So that's why we did ask the pronouns. So we can accurately um, address each person. Does anyone want to add to this list of ground rules for tonight's event? I was helping with the rock. Oh, <laughs> yeah, like don't misgender folks. So that's why uh, when we had our pronouns, um, just making sure that we can uh, actively work towards addressing people appropriately. Yeah, any other rules or you think that's good? Can I just ask why that last point is important and why we might want to consider that? Yeah, because when we uh, misgender folks, um, it creates an unsafe space for that person, right? So if they're not addressed correctly, um, I like to refer to your name. If someone's incorrectly using your name, then you're going to feel misjudged or not safe in that space. So that's why we really preface like use someone's pronouns. And for those of you who work with young people, um, just an additional fact, and I, I don't have the exact stat, but happy to get it, but we, there's also a lot of research that shows when you use affirming pronouns for young people, it significantly reduces the risk of suicide. Um, and so that's a huge opportunity for those of us working with young people to create that space to affirm mm -hmm. identities. So yeah. is it appropriate to ask someone to repeat it if you can't remember? Yeah, I In this space, yeah, I mean, it's better, I think, in my opinion. I'd rather be asked, yeah, like over and over versus incorrectly with Mr. Here. Yeah. yeah, I'm just wondering, um, it would feel like a safe space if it felt okay in the state. Mm -hmm. so, I'm going to try not to misgender anybody, but like. Assuming good intentions or forgiveness is a big deal, like something about it's okay to make a mistake. Yeah. Um, I think that's great. And I added it and I want to one up it to say that oftentimes we have good intentions and we still have harmful impacts on folks. And so being in a place that if you do make that mistake and you do harm someone in any circumstance, but also in tonight's space, being open to apologizing and kind of rectifying the harm. Any other comments with norms and um, just for tonight's? Okay. Um, so I think a lot of you know, so we already stated that we do sexual violence prevention and comprehensive youth sexuality education. So why are we doing a dead eye presentation? Like that's not our thing. We do sex ed and sexual violence prevention. 
Um, but I think what we really wanted to show was the importance that in order to do something like comprehensive sex ed, it's so critical that the community and the climate is rooted in, in equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice. Um, that we're creating these spaces where we can have conversations, like conversations you might have with sex education, or conversations you have with your young people that are maybe traditionally things that they don't want to bring to your to their parents. Um, but really thinking about how do we break down sort of all of these reasons that prevent us from doing a lot of the work that we know needs to happen in our communities. So how do we create this really amazing community foundation um, to really support all of this amazing work that's happening? Um, and how do we start confronting that and leading to an overarching goal? Um, so thinking about comp sex ed. So a lot of times we think about the fact that in order to do comprehensive sex ed, your community sort of has to be ready to create a climate and an environment in which young people can feel safe in learning a lot of the classes that they're just Yeah, and I was gonna say just with the last point, right? Like we're all in this together. So if we are all in this together, we have to think about the intersections of like race, gender identity, sexual orientation, ability, um, you know, religion, all of these different things um, that bring us all together because we're all um, basically a diversity and cultures and we have to bring that to the forefront. So that's why we talk about it and it's so important that we address all of it. And we're gonna cover um, anti-racism, which I think, you know, to some folks might be a huge word, but really um, it gets at the root of Jedi and we'll uh, further explain that. Um, so we just kind of wanted to, to start off just acknowledging that if you want to change, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. It's the reality that we've experienced, it's the reality that a lot of our partners who are oppressed regularly are experiencing on the daily. Um, and it's the reality is we find a lot of growth when we're willing to experience some discomfort in that process. And so I think folks who may at some point feel uncomfortable today with anything like that is a sign of growth, it's a sign of opportunity. Um, and so we encourage folks to lean into it. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I also wanted to say, um, because we have some limited time tonight and because this is such a big topic, I created a parking lot page. Um, so depending on some of the questions, we may place them on the parking lot and come back to them at the end just to kind of get through some of the information. Uh, but we'll just want to do the answer. Awesome. So what we're going to kind of start the presentation around is just knowledge. So we wanted to have a foundation and setting the stage for like what we determine all of these different issues. So I'm guessing a lot of you are already familiar with a lot of this. So as we're talking it through it, if you have different understandings or explanations or examples that you want to provide, please feel free to share those. Um, but we'll go through that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the history of racism and oppression in America. Um, and then we are going to go into sort of more action oriented steps related to dismantling um, white supremacy and doing its very <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Just throwing all the words. <laughs> um, but we're gonna, we're gonna start with words first. So um, we wanted to talk again about the foundational terminology. So the first place we're starting is bias. Um, folks generally familiar with bias? Um, so we think about that as the attitudes and stereotypes that are influenced oftentimes through sort of involuntary or external forces. So the things that were kind of grown and um, sort of inherently sort of exposed to that impacts how we perceive things. Um, and oftentimes we use that for how we perceive and interact with individuals. Yeah, and I was going to see the attitudes, so that's why I have like a thumbs up and a thumbs down, right? Is because often with our biases, we have positive reflections of certain individuals or organizations, and then we have negative perceptions too. And so that's something to think about is how you view things. Are you viewing it in a positive light or negative light and why? Yeah, and it's really critical to also say everyone has biases across the board. It doesn't matter your identity, everyone holds biases of some kind. So when we talk about biases and stereotypes, we have explicit bias. So I think a lot of us are really familiar with this, right? Where we see someone who's uh, showing sort of this explicit, like, oh, this person clearly is biased against this because they are have showing verbal harassment or actions that are uh, driven towards people. Um, so towards groups that have positive or negative preferences and who are aware of it. Implicit bias or what we call unconscious bias is recognizing that we are all built 
in a world that is full of oppression and we are sort of grown into that and so we have a lot of biases that we may not even be aware of so things that we say oh i look at that chair and i immediately think a positive or negative thought because of how i've been taught to think about chairs but i don't realize that i need to hold to this bias you know like this wooden chair versus this plastic chair over here um and so really thinking about that uh, and oftentimes are expressed without us knowing um, and so for folks who hold dominant identities and privilege I think part of the ask of us within our communities is really being able to identify and unpack when we have that unconscious bias and how to start training ourselves because we're still going to have it. We were raised to have it in the community and the culture that we are in America. It's going to happen. But how do you acknowledge it? How do you not be afraid of acknowledging it? And then how do you talk about it, unpack it, and try to avoid it? Yeah, and I was going to say with stereotypes, it's so important, right? Because based off of our biases, we start to have exaggerations and beliefs about certain people and groups. So oftentimes too, there will be a stereotype about like black folks, for instance, like all black people like watermelon. You know, like we start to create these ideations based off of social media and even people that we interact with on a daily basis. Um, and it really starts at a toddler age. A lot of the um, information that's passed on from parents starts so young. The toddlers really get that right away. And you can see it and we'll get to it in a minute on like their certain actions and what they choose. Um, I put this image right here of a black woman really to show like there's a lot of um, biases that come up with black women when they use their voice. Um, they often depict them as being angry, right? Because they're using their voice to challenge the system or oftentimes too, they may say like, why don't black folks smile a lot? Um, why are we being so defensive? Like um, what's bringing up these emotions? And a lot of those biases are just like natural, like just because of the system that we live in that perpetuates white supremacy. Is there a reason the second book doesn't Oh, that's a good thing. Yeah, um, we did focus a little bit on the, on the negative, and that's why um, we should have put in there too, that there is positive associations, and they are hidden too. So yeah, that's a good point. So any questions around the bias piece we're about to do next? <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna practice what I just said. So what we're gonna ask uh, before we move into the rest of our presentation is to split it to. Yeah, I'm thinking. Do you want to do uh, four groups of five? We'll have like one group of six though. Four groups of five ish. Um, and what we want you to do is just take a few minutes and go around and talk about like what are some of the biases we hold and acknowledge that we all have some biases. <laughs> Um, and so just taking the time for reflection to think about how are you showing up in the space today? Like what are you bringing with you when we're having these conversations today? Yeah, so we'll have five groups um, and I want you all to nominate one leader from your group to be able to talk about some of the biases that you all articulated within your group. Um, I'm gonna number each person off and then we'll go from there. We'll have ones here, twos, threes, and then fours and then five right there. Uh, one. I'm doing Zoom. Okay. So I'll be two. Okay, so yeah, all the ones right here, twos over there, three, four, and five. So we're going to take five or ten minutes, so it doesn't have to be in depth. Okay, I also just want to give folks who are on Zoom here today a little glimpse of our outdoor indoor classroom setting it's really lovely we wish you were here but we are going to do this activity on our own out here um yeah so if you want to turn on your screen and unmute yourself and join in we are going to discuss what biases you have and then i will be the one to deliver some of the things our group came up with back to um our in-person session so um does anyone want to get started if not i can go first um i mean bias biases come in many forms like we were talking about it doesn't have to always do with ethnicity or gender or sexual orientation it can be a lot of things like for me um I have a bias against 
Um, <laughs> oh man, I'm trying to think off the top of my head now. I think I have a bias against um, people who come to town in the North Fork Valley and, um, you know, take up all of the Airbnbs and are kind of perpetuating this whole like housing crisis we're having in Paonia. So I have a bias against them and it's not them or their characters, but there's like a bias there or like a association I have with them now that's negative. So that's my little, that's my little riff. Does anyone else have a bias? I was, oh, go ahead. Anyone else? Sorry, I, I'm muted and didn't know. Where are you going to go, Mara? Um, I was just going to say, you know, I, I have a bias against, and it's a little bit of self-protection. You know, it's like whenever I have to go for a run, particularly now as I get older and I'm not as probably strong as I was, I'm always a little bit more just leery of anyone when I'm running on my own. So, you know, and it's just, I think it's, space that space definitely a little bit more fear so and just personal safety cool thanks for sharing um hi guys i'm jordan evans um i'm a little sick so bear with me but i think uh for me right now especially after the past couple of years um just seeing how the politics have really affected paonian and honestly this whole county um, for me, it's when I'm out with my siblings and going in a store, going anywhere, and there's a car that has the Confederate flag or even just the um, American flag at this point for me, it makes me immediately like turn on my caution, kind of just like lights and just be aware of them and kind of make a wide girth around them, which is really unfortunate, but that is definitely a bias I hold right now. Totally. What about you, Mary? Well, I, I wonder about my biases. Um, I think one bias I have is when I see people having a gun on them, that my fear level goes way up and I'm, I'm feeling very different from them. So that's one bias I can think of immediately. Yeah, totally. One thing that is like a little bit, uh, I was just thinking about this while we were talking, that's a bias that I have that, you know, like we were talking about, it's just kind of like a cultural infusion that I didn't really consciously think of. But I have noticed since we've been having this conversation in our country more on race in the past year or so that I do tend to kind of be more cautious when I'm in, you know, like a neighborhood in like an urban area where there are more people of color. I have this kind of, um, kind of a bias to be like watching, watching like my belongings a little bit more. And it's such an interesting bias because, you know, whatever that's based in, it's interesting to observe that in myself. And when I catch myself doing something like that to just like take a breath and pause and realize, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm like acting and thinking differently right now based on the people I'm surrounded by. Um, and yeah, starting to kind of unravel all of these, you know, pretenses I have in my head towards certain communities. Um, Cause that's not the kind of person or leader that I strive to be in the community. So, but it really does start with recognition, I think. I'm really glad you actually brought that up. I started noticing that also the past two years. I grew up um, in Maryland, so there was a lot more diversity than um, mm -hmm. comparison to here, obviously. Um, and then growing up with that and then moving here and being here for 12 years now, um, obviously things change so that when I go back to an area that is more urban, I do, especially being surrounded by a lot of people that already believe that way of like, oh, I need to watch my stuff and be more cautious. I start to do that more often too. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Well, I feel as a white person who's a physician and I've had to work through the COVID issues, like 
I fit in until I had to wear a mask, until I had to kind of speak out against a lot of stuff. So it was really interesting to feel finally, you know, accepted in this community, which I'm very, I'm, I'm different from a lot. I mean, I think probably those on this call are similar to maybe some of my values. And, and I would say probably a lot of people here in this area are similar to values, but I've had to take care of a lot of patients that it's, it, it's really challenging. Um, and so it, it, you know, identifying with what's it feel like to be that other and to be okay with that. And um, I think my brother had sent out a video early on because he does, it's called Smule. And so you lip sync to music or they don't lip sync it. They actually sing it, but it's one of the songs from, uh, gosh, it's the mill. Anyways, there's a song about that and I'll, I'll remember it, but it just was this whole idea. Like you can be who you are and trying to step out. And it's, it's kind of really interesting to be in that situation. Yeah, totally. One bias that I've noticed that I think I'm getting a, like a lot more in tune with it now and dismissing it a lot quicker, but um, I used to feel like I would see people from diverse cultures and kind of wonder like, oh, I wonder where they're from when in reality, Americans are made up of so many different colors and the people who originally inhabited this land, you know, the indigenous folks who were here and the Ute and everyone else, they aren't white either so um it's interesting for me to kind of like point that out to myself consciously I was living in California briefly a couple years ago taking care of my niece and nephew and their parents got divorced and they were like 10 and 11 at the time and and I heard them say some some comment like oh there's like this Chinese boy in our class and and then they said and then there's an American boy or that's like how they were basically identifying the white classmates was that they were American versus, you know, the students of like Asian descent or African descent were not American. They were the other label. So it was really interesting to see like this ethnicity nationality pairing. And I was like, wow, that's like white supremacy at like a really young age, you know, without malintent, but it's still showing up in kids and like we were talking about in our presentation, even younger. It starts when you're a toddler and you start to make sense of the world. So that's something that I catch myself and it it's a lot different now, but just in making sure that I know that American does not equate to white necessarily. Cool, well, thanks for chiming in. I'm glad you all are on here. I'm trying to see if we have any more participants. We did have Karen Gibson in here at one point in time. She's not here anymore, um, but we invited a lot of the school district folks to come out and they didn't really quite show up. So um, is the audio okay with how the Zoom is inside the classroom? Can you hear all right? No, I really, think it's really oh, challenging to hear people. I'm sorry. Yeah, we had a bunch of technical issues right before the start of the of this um, meeting. So we, I'm on Alicia's phone right now. So I'm, I apologize for not being able to hear. I might try to scoot it a bit closer to the speakers. Um, if you'd rather hear them than see the presentation. I'll try to do that. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Duck under here. Um, our Zoom listeners are having trouble hearing, I think because the projector is kind of loud. So I'm wondering if I can put, just like set this on the desk so they can hear a little bit better. Yeah. Can you all hear me okay now? Ish? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. I'm just going to stick this. Yeah, so I thought we could, um, Dan, Danielle and I first could go around and just say some of our biases before we have each of you all talk about your biases. And so some of the biases that I come with um, is often with police. 
you know, I think just because of the harm that has been done, I think sometimes negative about police officers. You know, I think that they aren't out to get us and, you know, there is going to be police brutality. I can't really assume that or have a negative assumption all the time. So that's one bias I have. Um, I have a bias also when it comes to ability, you know, assuming everyone's able-bodied and not everyone is. There is a lot of disability that exists. So just being cognizant of that, and I have to challenge myself to think about that and how we show up in spaces. Yeah, and one of the things I talked about, I grew up in Texas and um, grew up with a bias sort of for folks with accents and Southern accents in particular and what that meant and eventually even trained myself out of saying y'all, which I now really regret in the equity world where it's the perfect word. <laughs> um, but just recognizing those biases. Um, also, we were dissecting and unpacking like, I still hold biases related to sizeism, and I know that, um, and exploring like my reactions to that and what I see and what I am taking in and how that's influencing my bias around that. So we wanted, we, you know, we did the same activity you all did. We wanted to kind of explore and put ourselves out there a little bit. Um, but do folks from each of the groups want to just share out a little bit of, you don't have to put it to persons or people, but kind of what, what came out in your groups? Should we start with group one? Uh, I think what we will do is we discuss um, on the surface is what I, I observed as some the three like main biases that most of the people in the corner um, usually tend to be like um, biases that have to be with men, with white men especially, um, and then uh, wealthy people or rich people. People in power who are not um, using their power to um, to create uh, equity more people who are abusing them. Yes. Uh, we also, yeah, we didn't, we didn't go much in depth. We discussed, I know people agreed with me, so that I, I'm coming from the background where I'm kind of thinking about this almost like I've been for the last few years. So I have different words and different ways to describe it and ways to go in depth and ways to step back. Um, but we were, we all agreed that like there's biases surrounding um, sexuality and intimacy. Um, there's biases with the marginalized groups. Um, we talked about the main one that's so prevalent um, is the bisexual bias, but now there's pansexual, which opens it up to um, different kinds of dynamics. Um, but the, the main, we're still, the LGBT community, do I, or the community is still a little bit stumped about how to add all these other activities. Um, so there's the trans bias. Um, as, a, as a lesbian, I know that there's a lot of bias towards trans women, which tends to break my heart. Um, uh, it's, it's just around me and it's close and it's in proximity and we all agree whether whatever our acceptance is or orientation is, um, that there's, there's intimacy and bias here um, and philosophy. So that we're doing this. Thanks for sharing. Group two. So we were, yeah, what we discussed were some biases that we picked up based on our upbringing. If we were maybe, um, yeah, one of us was raised in a pretty diverse community, but then realizing that that doesn't mean those biases aren't there. And then like I was raised in a pretty homogenous community and just pretty aware of the biases that I learned um, growing up. Um, other ones we talked about were like, um, biases against people that are not in your own identity. Um, sexual identity or um, income, like 
bias, I guess it's harder to do, um, and maybe takes more time, but um, things that our group shared was poor people aren't trustworthy, um, people with mental illness are going to bring drama, men are threatening, and that we need to protect ourselves from them, uh, Republicans are uneducated and tight and restrictive, um, that we hold negative bias towards um, people who use religion as a weapon and that religious people aren't trustworthy. Although, as you said, it depends on like, each of us as individuals kind of bringing different bias to the table. And um, yeah. And then we talked a little bit about stereotypes that we have towards um, groups of people, um, that black people are really good dancers as a positive, stereotype but plenty of stereotypes that um that um we hold towards black people as nurturing sweet subservient um separate um, and latino community liking hot spicy foods um things that seem obvious but uh but are not you know not true so Um, I'm done. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, we've had some explicit biases that we picked out, general and specific, and then also some stereotypes. And I'll just name off some of them here. Um, we women tend to be more empathetic. Men um, have more tend to show more power, judgment, be opinionated. Black people and Latinx people are more fun and engaging. Um, there's a bias around age. For example, older are more reluctant to change. And uh, Mexican men sexualize women more than other groups of people. Person of color, not a Republican. A person of color is likely not a Republican. This is a bias for um, Age bias to political affiliation. Uh, bias. Conservatives are right, not listening, can't move. No one, um, I don't know what I wrote. Um, and then travel biases, you know, when we go to places that they're more exotic or, you know, those types of things. So, that was it. I hope I represented you all well. Great. Yeah, so group five, uh, we spoke a lot for our uh, uh, experiences and so on. And so I hope that represent folks well. Certainly, uh, we all acknowledged the experience of bias and bias and our experience with others. Uh, for instance, initial experiences with people with pre pre prejudice or um, some initial interactions and concluding what that person would like to be, but finding that that dissipates over time. So experiencing that, that, that bias. Somebody throws us a question, what about the bit bias around the race? The conversation went towards socioeconomic and education as being feeling more prominent of a bias in the back. Um, we have our background, what influences that bias, um, and comparing and contrasting for those of us who, you know, who grew up in what we would call more diverse environments uh, as compared to 
Delta County, for example, feeling Delta County isn't representative and diverse. Um, and that, that leads to no one when you see person of color walking down the street, for instance. He spoke to how privilege influences our outlook uh, and the assumption of how others experience the world. Um, and the fact, uh, I use the term of cursed knowledge. He, just because I see the world a certain way, it's, it's hard not to assume somebody else doesn't see the world that way. Um, or how it's hard not to understand that somebody doesn't see the world that way. And um, I think you had used ability bias, which I realized that um, you know, I said ways of learning, ways of being, which I think would be a ability bias as well. So I don't know if group five wants to add anything, but did I cover it? Okay. Um, I have a group. Yeah, sure. you all come up, and I hope it wasn't like um, enlightening to hear from other people and their experiences with bias, but also understand the bias that I came from and come with to the table. Yeah. Could I share on behalf of our Zoom group really quick? Uh, we discussed having biases, you know, when you've lived in like what how Marilee described a homogenous kind of community, predominantly white, and you go to a community where there's more diversity and there's more people of color, how um, some of us tend to kind of have this bias of feeling like we kind of clutch our belongings a little bit tighter because we might feel like, you know, things might get snatched. Um, we also talked about a, a bias about like as a female running alone, like actually going on a run, how you feel pretty on guard and potentially unsafe. Um, and that might be more of just like a safety kind of concern, but it could come from a bias as well. Um, and I can't quite think of other things. Oh, and then we also talked about, you know, hearing children say things that Kind of reflect this idea that to be American is to be white and that to be a person of color you get described as your you know your race rather than being described as American um, and kind of seeing that from as an adult and thinking about how oh I might have that bias to some extent too but hearing it <clears throat> come from the mouth of like a 10 year old is pretty um, uh, pretty black and white. I think that's mostly what we had to say. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for sharing. And I, I want to, I think folks really identified a lot of biases and stereotypes. And I think that's the opportunity to sort of sit with these things that maybe we don't want to admit <laughs> that we hold, that feels kind of icky for us to admit that we hold, um, and to really sort of ready ourselves and challenge ourselves to own it and unpack it and explore it um, as we do this work. So we're going to talk a little bit, I'm going to, uh, we still have some definitions we're going to work through and I'm probably going to move through a little bit quickly just because we have more action oriented stuff at the end and it sounds like that's what a lot of folks are really interested in too. Um, if, I, if I go too fast, feel free to stop us. Um, but we first wanted to talk a little bit about oppression um, and we kind of formally define oppression in a little bit, but um, when we think of oppression, we oftentimes, and like things like isms, so racism and other forms of isms, we oftentimes think about interpersonal oppression. That's the piece that we see most often, it's the piece we experience, it's the piece that we perpetuate ourselves sometimes. Um, it's the piece that kind of feels like it's in front of us. And so oftentimes we think about like, oh, that's all it is, right? It's just the interpersonal interactions between two people, and like that's the experience of oppression or racism or other forms of um, but really, it's sort of this iceberg model. And really what's at play is that we're starting at this bottom section of ideological, and it's this idea. This, this idea exists that one group is better than another and has the right to control, period. Um, and in America, our history deems white, cis, heterosexual men, lots of others, age sometimes comes into it, religion comes into it, um, and in terms of sort of that dominant group that is believed to be better than others. And then what happens is we take that idea and historically and presently, we embed it into the way we operate. So we have systems and the system that systemic mistreatment, right? So we have policies at play. We have environments, built environment that impacts people's access, transportation, 
So all of these systems at play that are perpetuating and sort of reinforcing this idea we have that there's one group better than the other. And then that's where you hit the interpersonal, right? So you have these systems and oftentimes we don't talk about it and we don't see them. They're sort of hidden. And so this is the opportunity to start exploring and saying like, oh, this is a policy that is perpetuating this, it's reinforcing it. Um, and what we see oftentimes is sort of the impact of that, which is that interpersonal oppression. So what you see between two people, so an individual against another individual. And then ultimately, you see a lot of internalized oppression, which is folks who hold marginalized identities starting to believe this idea that they are less than others as well. And ultimately, unintentionally, also perpetuating oppression amongst their own community or other communities. And so it's sort of this, this vision of how everything kind of interacts and is connected to one another and how much of this goes unseen. Yeah, and I was going to say too, so when we're thinking about oppression, it's really the unjust treatment of another person or a group of folks. And you may ask, how does that connect to biases and stereotypes, right? Well, because of those biases and those stereotypes, it results in the unjust treatment of certain folks and individuals. And that's why we talked about the four different levels, because um, if you think about your biases internalized, or well, first, if you have your biases uh, from the ideological, it goes into the institutions that we work in and the businesses, the organizations we work in. Then it goes into an interpersonal level, the friends, our peers, and our family members. And then we internalize those feelings inside. And that often results in negative attitudes, often about our own people and our culture. Yeah, so I love both of these images because one depicts um, a Black girl. Um, so I don't know if any of you have um, seen this experiment. Um, there was an experiment done on Black uh, children basically choosing between a black doll and a white doll. And oftentimes what we see is the black child will always choose the white doll. And what it shows is, is that they choose the white doll because they believe it's the most beautiful doll. They believe it's the societal exceptions of beauty. And it's so wrong because it doesn't allow for other races and cultures to really show that there is different methods of beauty and beauty looks different across the board. It's this model that only white folks are beautiful which is really sad. Um, and that's how this is internalized oppression because this black girl was taught that and she's internalized it and now she believes it. And this is how she's always gonna see herself is not beautiful. So we hope, hope that you know she grows up and is able to shift her mindset to think black women are beautiful and not that they're not. Um, and this is another context too. So I love saying this, no one is free when other people are oppressed. So how can we all work together um, you know, as people if we're oppressing each other? and people are, are down. And we all, no matter our identities, gain something from disrupting the system. So we're going to go through a few things. I think a lot of these may be familiar. Some may not be, uh, but we'll move kind of quickly. So racism, which is associated with power and systemic injustice, kind of thinking back to that iceberg, but is the prejudice and discrimination on the basis that different races are superior or inferior to one another. So in America, that is white folks as a race are superior to other races. Um, and again, history is really different. So I think it's really important to contextualize this whole conversation for where we are. So place and time is really, really critical when we're talking about oppression and isms. So we are in America in 2021, I don't know what year it is anymore. Um, and thinking about, you know, this may look different in different contexts and different places and different times, but where we are in America, the dominant culture is white, cis, hetero, men, right? Um, and so I think it's really important to consider sort of where you are and how race and oppression is placed. Um, and then prejudice, um, just really hostility towards another person based on their race or culture, um, nativism, so against immigrants, uh, sexism against uh, or, well, against anyone that doesn't fill the dominant culture, which would typically be um, I don't know where to put that, male, um, male and men. Yeah. Um, so specifically prejudice against cisgender um, and trans women and women. And um, this is, it's really hard for folks to accept. So I'll often say like people of color can't be racist. And people are like, how? That doesn't make any sense. Well, because we root racism with power and systematic injustice, right? So if we're looking at power in the hierarchy within our system, our folks of color can be prejudiced, that's correct, but they don't have power, right? Because of the system 
at play that really helps perpetuate white cisgender heterosexual men that are often Christian and able-bodied to be at the highest level within all of our systems. So is that to say racism isn't an individual context, systemic context? Yeah, I mean, but it's also individual too. It hits all levels, like individual, internalized, like yeah, institutionalized. I, I think we are individuals who oftentimes are perpetuating racism within a system that we built to ensure racism continues. Ooh. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's why we say it's a virus, right? Because just like a virus that attacks the body, it's like one cell attacking another cell before it hits the whole body. And it's the same with racism. Before you know it, it starts with one person and it continues everywhere until everyone's acting in racist ways. Yep. And it is a we've been talking about like dual pandemic. It is a it is, you know, it is racism is a crisis, it is a pandemic that we are facing in the midst of each other. Um, we talked, we threw out some of these words earlier, but ableism, so again, sort of discrimination based on physical or intellectual ability, so if you're able-bodied um, or not. Um, ageism, I think it came up in some of the, the pieces of stereotyping and bias we all talked about. So thinking about who holds power based on age in America and what biases or prejudices we hold based on age. Genderism, so basing the assumption that there are only two genders that we are on a gender binary. Um, and that cisgender folks are superior to all other forms of folks on a gender binary, sorry, gender spectrum. Uh, heterosexism, basically everyone's straight. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that heterosexuality is superior to other forms of sexual orientations and identities. Um, and then colonialism is really uh, discrimination based on socioeconomic status, wealth, power. Um, with an effort to kind of take full control. Any questions on the isms? Were any of these new folks or were folks pretty familiar? Someone? I don't think I've ever heard heterosexism, just sexism, but that's interesting. I've never heard gender. I think the sexism one is really interesting because again, it's we tend to have a, a default or a reference, which is almost always dominant culture. So we say sexism and we know that it's really heterosexism, but we don't mean that. Does everyone know what cisgender is? No? Okay, so cisgender is your gender identity matches with the sex assigned at birth. So when we identify, like I identify as trans because my gender identity doesn't match my sex assigned at birth, biologically. Yeah. I was gonna ask the distinction between um, heterosexism as it has to do with sexuality and sexism, which is oppression of, as I've heard it over the years, oppression of women. Well, and it's with heterosexism, right? It's this assumption that there is only just two genders, right? It's just male and female, and that's it. So that's heterosexism. And then just with sexism, um, we're also dealing with like women, how do you put in the context of um, is often women are put in systems where they're subordinate or they don't have enough power at play because of the systems that they operate within. So like job opportunities, there's sexism at play when women don't have opportunities for growth to become like a CEO or like in a high level position of power. So sexism is separate from heterosexism, it's just not it just, it calls it out more so because we often contextualize sexism in a heterosexual way. We don't allow for the opportunity for different gender identities and expressions. It was on the first page, sexism. Oh, sexism. Yeah, and then that with sexism, we could also, on the opposite, we say all men are pregnant. Yeah, that's what it is. You got your little, when you get off the couch, you go, Yeah, on that bias, right? Yeah. Um, and then just to touch on a, a few others that we've also kind of noted, so homophobia, um, I'm not going to read all of these because I think we're really familiar, you 
lot of which are um, transphobia, um, so fear of transgender folks or prejudice against transgender folks, sizeism, which is something I noted earlier, so prejudice or discrimination or bias against people based on body size and shape, um, and then environmental racism, so um, environmental mistreatment and discrimination, so oftentimes you'll see that some of the worst instances of environmental hazards are associated with racism and the, the value we place on certain communities and where we put things in our world. Yeah, and an example too, there's often been toxic waste sites often placed in like predominantly like black neighborhoods or Latinx neighborhoods. And that's intentional, right? Because white folks that have had opportunity and power don't want it in their neighborhood, but they're like, oh well, give, give it to the people of color. Yeah, and so that's very problematic when it comes to environmentalism. I'm gonna say there's a stat of like over 40% of all sick funds, like 12 or 1,500 sick fund sites in the United States, and over 40% of them are on indigenous land. Yeah. Uh -huh. so yeah. yeah, and we're going to talk a little bit about that when we talk about current examples of racism. Um, and then talking a little bit about um, when we have isms, they marginalize and uh, oppress and effectively promote white supremacy and patriarchy because that is the dominant culture in America. Um, and that is sort of how our system is built. So thinking about marginalization, treatment of person um, or a group as insignificant. So again, those folks or communities that be deemed less valuable, less important, less powerful. Um, and oppression, we already covered, we covered that earlier. Um, and then white supremacy is really what is rooted in this, especially in the context of America, but also worldwide in a lot of circumstances, but the belief that white, heterosexual, cisgender, able-bodied men are superior to all other races, genders, sexual orientation. Um, and with white patriarchy kind of feeds into that as well, where those same folks who hold dominance also hold power um, and the systems are built for them to maintain that power. Yeah, because there's some things like if there's white supremacy, it can be a culture there's a white patriarchy, right? Based off of the system, and those folks don't want any other person to be able to attain power. So they'll do everything within their power to maintain that power and keep the status quo. That's what we often see with a lot of rich white men. They keep their wealth and power and they'll do anything they can to maintain it. And if you're thinking about that iceberg, oftentimes folks are familiar with white supremacists. And that's sort of that interpersonal part of the, the iceberg. But when we think of white supremacy, it's that ideological. It's the piece that's sort of under that current that's encouraging and perpetuating everything that's going on. Races often, we often see people of color being less than white folks. Um, if we go more in time um, or further past slavery, we go to the Jim Crow laws. So that was also like kind of enslavement. Um, it was just racial segregation, right? It was these laws created like whites versus blacks. And oftentimes we thought or we deemed it to be equal, but it wasn't. It was unjust um, treatment. And that even goes with like Brown Board of Education 
and all of those cases. Um, and even just with voting, um, we wanted to restrict the voting rights of Black folks, um, which was awful because we knew that if we gave Black folks the voice, that they would have an opportunity to change the system, and that's what we didn't want um, in America. The other two um, is redlining. So even after Jim Crow laws, with the Federal um, Housing um, Authority, FHA with loans, what they would do is give loans to Black folks in certain neighborhoods. Um, and it was awful because they didn't have opportunity for growth and economic growth. And so we really um, segregated Black folks to certain neighborhoods. And that's how it gets even more traumatizing. Um, and just the opportunity for success wasn't there due to that. Um, and if we go fast forward to on the war on drugs, um, really targeting BIPOC folks um, with drugs and putting them into the criminal justice system. So you see, it, it started from the beginning, right? Colonization, slavery, Jim Crow laws, redlining, and then war on drugs. It's, it's here even to this day, it's not left. And it's so problematic because the system shouldn't be repeating itself um, century over century, but it does. So we have to. I feel like I'm, as I look at it, it's like changing clothing, but yeah. it's not right. Uh -huh. Because reading back to when slavery happened or Jim Crow, it's it's the same thing happening yes. and then you see it and you know it's like shocking as a white person who's never learned any of this that like this is no different mm -hmm. than what was happening you know during um, colonization <laughs> yeah and that's what i see it's like we may not be you might not be killing us right now but like when you look at police brutality that's still an effort of killing right or criminal justice system always locking us up that's still enslavement um, and it still continues. Yeah. I just heard on the radio talks about uh, forced sterilization. Ooh, oh, we're yeah. just gonna get that yeah. on the next oh slide. Yeah. 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 Okay. And that that's just come out like recently. Oh, yeah. It's incarcerated. Yes. That's a perfect transition. Yeah. So right into sexual health racism. Have you seen like? Oh yeah, uh huh, yeah, yeah. Racism just continues to perpetuate. So we even see with the Tuskegee experiment, where black folks, especially um, black men, were used as experiments, where they injected black men with syphilis, um, to like basically test, yeah, uh huh, yeah, to show the impact of syphilis and STI on what it could do to the body without giving a cure. So a lot of these black men died, which is so problematic because why are black bodies being used as type, uh, tests? Subjects, you know, we shouldn't be. We're human beings just like anyone else, but we're always deemed as a test subject. Um, this also goes with eugenics um, and just the forced sterilization of women. So, BIPOC women specifically, um, those um, that have been deemed feeble minded or even mentally defective, they didn't want them producing children because they thought it was immoral for our society to have children that are mentally defective. So, yeah, they were forced sterilization so that way they couldn't have children. Yeah, the harm. Yeah. Um, Yeah, and just even more so, we know uh, Dr. Sims did experimental surgeries on um, Black women that were enslaved during the 19th century. So again, using um, just a Black body as a test subject. Um, BIPOC women even today have been targets of birth uh, control uh, contraception usage as a way to prevent Black women from getting birth. Um, they didn't want Black women. That wasn't a thing. Um, and just even with the sterilization we've seen in 2010 in California prisons, um, black BIPOC women based on uh, eugenics also were sterilized, which is awful because it's, it's the 20th year, 20 percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still happening. It's just Isn't the mortality rate also higher for yeah. uh -huh. BIPOC women but, um, in, uh, with regard to pregnancy and birth? Yes, mm -hmm. the mortality and the reason why it's progressive, right? We have these systems that don't understand Black women that experience pain. A lot of doctors understand or they believe that Black women can have or deal with pain even more so than what they actually can. So that's why it often results in like death 
or not having the right adequate supplies or really listening to their needs. Um, Serena Williams actually addressed this and she's rich. You know, we thought it was tied to wealth. Like if you're poor, that's why this is happening. And if you have money, it wouldn't happen. And that's just not true. Serena Williams, um, she's mostly known, has so much money and still dealt with this slavery system kind of give birth to um, her daughter. So, awful. Even if you have money, it doesn't matter. Um, and even just to this day, I kind of talked about like pretty, uh, police brutality, just the wrongful deaths of like black and brown folks, uh, the disproportionate sentencing of black and brown folks. So we know when white folks get um, sentenced, it's not at the same rate as black and brown folks when they're sentenced. That's often far more times, I think three to four times harsher than what it should be. Um, there's been instances of extremist groups advocating for discrimination, violence, um, racist policies, um, most notably was the environmental racism. Um, this was the Keystone Project, so that really harmed a lot of indigenous folks. Um, President Biden actually stopped that, which is good, um, but that was very problematic. And just with uh, race and sex, we see wage gaps. So women are paid less than men on the dollar. Uh, I think it's like seven cents per dollar than men. Um, and then just explicit violence, you know, against like the indigenous women, we still see them being murdered. Um, we saw Asian women at parlors in Atlanta being killed. Um, it's, the violence is still happening. We have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. but, Daniel, do you want to touch on this or? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then just to continue on, just to continue on that, uh, we also see a lot of queer exclusion, homophobia, transphobia. We talked a lot about that yesterday at the panel and how it's connected to sex health and oftentimes we exclude the experiences of LGBT plus folks in our education systems, as well as a myriad of other places. Um, sexism, so I think Deja really already spoke to this, particularly around glass ceilings and, and being paid less to the dollar. Um, and then xenophobia, which we've also seen quite a bit um, in our recent history in America, um, but prejudice and fear towards immigrants and undocumented folks. So I think out of like, I feel like what I keep coming up with is everything that you find wrong, all of it is ridiculous. Ooh, I feel like I feel like every time I'm like, hey, wait a minute, you know, it's all this is like all this is everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and then so that's not no a crazy, you know, because now in my head I'm like racism, racism, you know, and I'm like thinking, I need to talk to people about this because it's all racism, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I talk with Daniel about this and I'm like, what do we do? Like, it just keeps happening over and over. Yeah, and I think it's important. So in the work that we do, we acknowledge that there, nothing is monolithic and there are so many different identities and intersectional identities, right? And so people who are experiencing racism, but also transphobia or racism and also ableism or all of these things. And what we know though, is that when you, um, add in racism within other identities that are experiencing oppression, it significantly compounds those experiences. Um, and we know how much of our history was immediately based in this idea of white supremacy. Um, and so a lot of times we really try to center our work around racism while also bringing in all the other intersectional identities that are currently being oppressed within that system as well. Okay, so are y'all ready for Jedi? I know we like did a lot, like biases, um, history, and it's a lot to take in and soak in. Do y'all want to break or are you ready to go into strategies? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm gonna do the boring stuff and do more terminology. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, are folks familiar with diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, I'm not gonna go through this in too much, uh, but recognizing sort of diversity is sort of having folks who represent different identities. Um, in a space. And diversity does not equal equity. It does not equal inclusion. You can have lots of diversity and still be incredibly exclusionary. Um, and so it's really important to acknowledge that just bringing in people of different identities into a space, you still need to explore inclusion and promoting that sense of belonging um, and perspectives that are all sort of leveraged for good in that space. Um, and when you do that, you are moving towards equity and recognizing that um, all individuals have different needs associated with their identity. And so I think this, you want to explain the Yeah, graphics. so, okay, a lot of folks will be like, well, what if we just be equal? So this is kind of like a stepping stone if we're going to a baseball game, right? And if we all have different heights, and we're like, hey, let me just give you the same chair 
Well, that doesn't work for me because I'm shorter. So how am I going to see? As you see with the child that's looking at the fence, they can't even see the game. So equality is not the answer. That's not what we're trying to move towards. Equity is, okay, so we see that this kid can't see the fence. Let me give you two more boxes so you can see. That's equity, right? We see the disadvantages that play, but we're going to give you an advantage so that you can see it, just like the other person who's tall enough to see it over the fence. Does that kind of make sense between equality and equity? And then we're going towards inclusion. So some folks will be like, well, if we just do the resources where folks can just see across, that's enough. Well, actually, why do we even have the fence in the first place? So if we remove the fence, then we don't even have to worry about people not even seeing it at all. So that's what we really should be moving towards. And then liberation is not only including people within, but allowing them to maybe even be part of the game. They haven't not traditionally been a part of it. And so what do we do to give them liberation? So it's this movement from equality all the way to really just liberation. How do we get people to feel liberated? And I think when you think about equality and the challenges of equality is that you can also see that you're giving resources to someone who doesn't need them for this particular instance, right? And so it's perpetuating this opportunity for folks in power to continue to gain more and more power or whatever that looks like. Um, and that's the challenge is when you focus on sort of this equal versus Yeah, equality is, is not what we should be moving for. We have to go through liberation and diversity, equity, and inclusion will get to liberation. Um, so then we talked a little bit about inequity, so policies and processes that create fewer opportunities. So oftentimes you'll hear for public health people, so we talk a lot about disparities. Um, disparities is sort of the data that shows the result of inequity. Um, so we know that there are these inequities that create these disparities for people that we see differences in, in outcomes for folks. Um, and so the system at play. Um, and then justice is really, um, oftentimes you talk about DEI, um, or EDI, however you want to put that yeah. acronym together, um, but equity, diversion, <laughs> diversity, and inclusion. Uh, um, and so that's the, the piece on Jedi. And so the anti racist approach to actually create more opportunities for marginalized groups that are just systemic. Any questions on that? Okay, so this really shows kind of like what I was articulating before is liberation is justice, right? So it's really creating um, equity, inclusion, um, and it's going beyond just diversity with people, equity and policy and practices and inclusion empowering folks. You're really going towards those equitable opportunities to allow people to be successful. And that's what we have to shift our mindsets. A lot of folks are just getting diversity and you have to move all the way to justice to really create um, credible change within a system. And to give an example, because I know there's a lot of business owners particularly in the room, um, what we've seen like in our office space is oftentimes we succeed in bringing in diverse folks and then they don't stay because it's not a good space. Um, so really thinking about that inclusion piece because just bringing in, how are you going to actually retain? How are you creating a space for retaining folks that you're bringing in to create diversity and honor the experiences and expertise that they bring to yeah, and diversity is not enough. We can have BIPOC folk at the table. There's still going to be racism. So what are we doing about the racism part? So these are some like initial um, Jedi strategies um, that we think are really important is don't ignore your biases. So that's why we had you all start that activity is really understanding those biases and stereotypes. Um, once you do that, you start to acknowledge them and accept them. And then we want you to reflect, why do you see those uh, biases in the first place? And then move to challenging them. So what can you do to think differently and challenge other people to move? You wanna seek opportunities to learn from other communities of color or communities that you have not traditionally heard from. Educate yourself and don't be a, bi or be a bystander, sorry. So when you um, are in opportunities where there's homophobia, sexism, um, ableism, call people out and say, hey, this isn't right. This isn't gonna help us change our system. I'm sure we can also get this shared out. So how do you do anti-racism in your work? We don't have all the answers. Um, 
I, someone once told me that America has never had a just equitable world. We don't know what that looks like. You don't, you don't know. So um, there's not one way, these are just some ways. I think there's so much comprehension and so much more that we can be doing. Um, but I think critically prioritizing, hiring and empowering black and brown faces. But again, it's more than just bringing them into the space. Um, prioritizing, hiring and empowering queer trans voices. The same for folks experiencing disabilities. Providing healing circles for black, brown, queer voices and folks experiencing disabilities. There's been immense harm that's happened in the history and presently within our country in creating the space for that healing. Discussing intersectionality and technology. We come with multiple identities and all of those identities come down for different experiences and different outcomes for us and the way that we experience life every day. So how do we acknowledge that and see that? Um, ensuring materials are accessible to all. Um, so oftentimes we think about that for like language justice and language accessibility. So making sure that you also have something in Spanish or in another pro uh, prominent language, um, but really thinking about that for folks who are able-bodied. So can someone get to the event that you're hosting if they are not able-bodied? Um, we're thinking about other aspects of education or gender or age and sex. And then instilling culturally responsive trauma-informed and harm reduction approaches, which is a lot of folks familiar with all these terms. Um, and, and sort of centering cultural humility. So this is a lot about like, what does it mean to create some of this space? Can we talk about cultural responses in the last one? Yeah, I can take cultural responses. Yeah. Um, so culturally responsive, so I think, Making sure that the space is acknowledging and representative of the different cultural identities that are held by the folks in that space. Um, I think there's a lot more that you can talk about that, but when you think about like education and curriculum, how are you embedding experiences that are that resonate with folks of different identities? So that that curriculum, for example, would then be culturally responsive to where the experiences are. Yeah, and that ties directly with cultural humility because um, oftentimes we'll call for like uh, LGBTQ plus uh, cultural competency trainings, but it's more than just being competent, right? And like understanding LGBTQ plus um, experiences, you have to really show empathy and understanding and really drive what are the needs of that population. So that's cultural humility is really understanding the needs of certain communities that are not at the table and centering those and allowing those folks to be able to drive the process if possible. The humility component. Um, something came to mind when you were describing that, and, and that is, is there a way to connect? I feel in this context, we're connecting very closely with the, the, the struggle, the struggle, the struggles of of a diverse group of, of people. How, how do we? Do you go into connecting with the uh, celebrations? That's something that might be, I don't know, that's just something that came to mind to describe the humility, the cultural humility. Connect, wanting to connect in celebration when maybe that feels like a foreign space. Could it be something like giving Juneteenth? Oh, come on, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Like Black yeah. History Month, we need yeah. to celebrate that. And it should be within organizations to send out newsletters and opportunities about people to learn about the history of Black folks and, and the activism that we've done and why it's so important. Indigenous um, Heritage Month, Latinx Heritage Month, why are we not in Asian Heritage Month? We should be celebrating all of these different communities. Uh, Pride Month, you know? And recognizing yes. holidays. Yes. Yes. Other people have them. But I, I will say as, as a cautionary that those are important and good, but if they are not backed up by other further actions in your space, it's, it could be performative, right? Like, yeah. I'm going to pretend that I care about this and a holiday, but I'm still going to treat you really badly when you're... Which is kind of how they're feeling right now, like given it, that it is a national holiday, but racism in policy is still right. um, deeply rooted. Yeah, it's like, why am I going to celebrate the American flag and what it means to be American when my people continue to be oppressed and marginalized and there's still racism? Like, what are we doing? Um, I think 
we saw that too with the national anthem with a lot of football players like kneeling because why pay homage to a country that doesn't celebrate our successes and our joys? Um, and we also, Dean and I were just talking about it um, as an example, but for um, Pride um, and how many businesses put out materials in, in honor of LGBTQ plus communities and for Pride and money through that and it was just for a month and then the rest of the year, there's nothing in the policy. <laughs> Um, so really thinking through like what's the long jeopardy sustainability for how are we really embedding it's anti-racist when you're really changing the policy and the system of how you're operating and i, I tell folks are you really an ally if you're only supporting me during june <laughs> what about the rest of the year um like hello like, there's still 11 months of the year i need support you know <laughs> yeah oh, okay. um <laughs> And just more anti-racist priorities is, I think it's so important to think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So when we are thinking about our communities of color, what are those needs that most essential, like are essential, right? Like food, water, shelter, that's number one. Safety, right? Like, do we feel safe walking out in neighborhoods, like running, like, no. Um, love and belonging, like friendship and intimacy. Um, and that ties into esteem, how we view ourselves with like respect and then self-actualization. Um, what can we become based off of the system that we live in? Like I, I can have my physiological needs met and safety, but then do I even, can I become the most powerful person I can be because of the system we live in? Probably not, because there's not systems in place to help me thrive. Uh, addressing cultural differences. So some folks would be like, we're all people like, we're all of color, you know, we're all of culture. Well, hold on. We all are different and we have to celebrate that. We have to acknowledge that there are differences because that's how we come to a better place. Um, some people will say like, I see no color. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no. Um, acknowledging a lot of the barriers that a lot of us face. Um, so something may be medically accurate, but it's different for each community. So not normalizing how information is given to certain communities. And really trying to like dismantle barriers. So, what you were talking about with social determinants of health, there's disparities and inequities with housing, transportation, uh, education, the job workforce. We really need to change all of that. Okay. Yeah. And um, I have this model. So, it's ACEs. So, has anyone heard of ACEs before? Yeah, so a lot of times, um, because of our communities and the oppression and marginalization that we don't face, but even in communities that don't face oppression necessarily, there are childhood experiences that impact us. And those um, experiences are often traumatic. And that is how we live our lives constantly in trauma. And our responses to that trauma is always survival mode. And so if we're always in survival mode, we can't really thrive because we're always thinking about how am I surviving? So that's something to really be cognizant of. Um, it shows up in history, medication, or medicine and um, education. Uh, we put in here putting space for soft skill um, conversations, talking about joy rather than just the challenges, um, trying to shift the mindset from just policies and procedures to really not only help folks of color, but also allow them to drive the process and create those systems of change. Yeah, and this is, an, I put this in um, because ACEs oftentimes can lead to death, right? A lot of those traumatic experiences that we have go into our social conditions. It affects our brain and the way we operate. Um, studies have shown, I think there's an increase in like serotonin levels within the brain, and that's a marker for um, anxiety, and it increases your um, heart rate, which often can lead to like, heart disease. And so it's, problematic because the trauma is a direct correlation to its impact on the body um, and how we see it. Um, we can also see it with folks having or engaging in high-risk behavior because of their trauma and thinking in survival mode, um, disability issues, and then death. Yeah. Um, so some further other priorities is building, and we I kind of already spoke to this actually, but connection, safe spaces, and trust for BIPOC folks, um, having members of the community working in their community, 
um, fostering an environment that uh, cultivates these conversations of wellness and emotions and physicality that includes all of the experiences across both the different identities. Providing, we kind of spoke to this already, racial justice and gender healing circles. So for example, in some of our spaces in our office, we caucus by race because we acknowledge that for some of us who will dominate culture, particularly as being white, oftentimes our process of learning about privilege is very harmful in other spaces. And a lot of our folks, our colleagues of color need that space outside to be able to heal from that too. And so we really have some of these conversations separately to be able to come back together um, and have it sort of become more cohesive. Yeah, because white folks will often come to like BIPOC folks to be like, what do we do? And it's and it shouldn't be at us to come to you with the solution. Like you've already harmed us, you've already mistreated us, and now you want us to come up with the solutions on what you should do. Like, no, you should be the ones creating solutions to change the system. Um, and then having, I think, yeah, um, oftentimes, and I think this speaks to sort of the diversity versus inclusion. We bring folks in, uh, specifically QT BIPOC, so queer trans BIPOC um, experts into the room, but we don't actually give them any power in that space, right? We tokenize um, and we really don't ensure inclusion. Awesome. Um, has any, are, is anyone here familiar with the white supremacy culture characteristics? Um, so I'm going to note that my office and my circles have been working to unpack these, like, I don't know how many, 10, 12 characteristics for over a year. Um, this is a lot. Um, so this is just a quick introduction. But basically, the argument um, is that we have components of our culture that have been developed directly as a result of our ideological thinking of white supremacy. And so when we see these things in operation, especially in our professional spaces, these are the things that are ultimately perpetuating white supremacy and a lot of the oppression that we see. Um, so there's a really amazing document that we can share and that can maybe be shared out that goes in depth uh, for what each of these mean, as well as antidotes, um, but really thinking about like how does perfectionism show up and how do we think oftentimes um, perfectionism and success is, is coded language. It's really about like, what do we deem success as in our white communities? Um, or what do we deem as perfect based on perspective of white perfection? Um, even when you think about color schemes, black versus white, um, the pure definition of like white being pure and perfect, um, untainted. Uh, and so really thinking about even to our most basic concepts, how much of that is rooted in these concepts of, of supremacy. Uh, oftentimes we worship written work. So we reflect on these things that everything has to be written down there to happen. And we don't recognize sort of the different cultural experiences that are shared through verbal or auditory learning. So for example, a lot of our programs we work with, we now do um, multiple different ways that they can report their work back to us instead of always doing written reports. So we can come out and just visit you or we can just have a call. There are multiple ways that we can get information from you about what your work is going to look like. There's so many. Yeah. <laughs> uh, either or is a really great one when we're talking about gender binary. Um, we biologically categorize by binary. We look at a chair and we say, is it blue? No. Great. Is it green? No. Is it orange? Yes. Okay. That's an orange chair. And that's how we process information. And so we do that a lot with so much of our other pieces. And we think about that. So when we think about binary and like there is only man and there is only woman, there is male and female, and there's not the spectrum of gender identity. Uh, or spectrum of sexual orientation. Um, and so we often find ourselves kind of stuck in this, there can only be one right way and there's only an either or. And so much of this is connected and it's, it's challenging to describe all of it in a really short amount of time, but I wanted to kind of introduce. Um, and when I first saw this, I was really confused. Because I was like, this just feels like American culture. <laughs> and I was like, all right, we're like in American culture. Who has been in power historically in America? These are really rooted in this idea of white supremacy and perpetuating power um, with this idea of white supremacy because America was built on that. So American culture is white supremacy, white supremacy culture. Um, I had the same reaction. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it was 100% my first reaction. I would also say the thing that is interesting when you unpack this is I think for those of us who hold a lot of privilege, it helps us understand the value in doing this work because this is harmful for all of us. Like perfectionism, how many of us as individuals deal with perfectionism and how harmful is that to us? And how much of that is embedded in our systems? Um, and so dismantling white supremacy holds so many benefits for everyone, regardless of levels of power and privilege. Yes. Well, and another good example is think about, you know, we were talking a lot about the, I think, defined colonialism earlier, but we think about indigenous cultural practices and how many of those started in America but were deemed not appropriate and no longer are part of the mainstream. Um, so how do we how do we think differently about what it is? Um, and what we, how we approach this. So a growth, America being a, of a growth mindset, right? wouldn't that be part of, I mean, that would be the white supremacy as well, right? Ooh, come Constantly on. be growing and, and you know, gaining more wealth, having yes. more companies all over the world. Yeah, it's about yeah, prioritizing quantity over quality. Oh, right. I probably did that one in. Um, so oftentimes when we define success, it's numbers, yeah. right? Um, or we define success like who defines success? Mm -hmm. How do you define success? So in our work, we are a funding agency. We work with a lot of community partners. And the historical relationship is the funder comes in and says, this is what success looks like in your community. Do this. Um, but what does it look like if we go to our community partners and actually say, you tell us what, what success is and tell us how you're we're not going to tell you what that means for your community. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So lots, lots to unpack here. Um, it took me a lot of time, honestly, to sit with it and understand it. And, and it took a lot of time to understand how each of these really is connected to a history of racism because it absolutely is. You can tie any one of these characteristics to a history or racism in our history. Like yeah. capitalism. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. To yeah. Sexism, homophobia. Right. What's the default of religion? Ooh, um, yes. So, um, in America, the, the dominant religion that holds the power and privilege is Christianity. And that's what a lot of our policies have built, been built on. And we see marginalization of folks of color religions. Um, and I think that it's something that we've talked a lot about is that, yes, this is tied to white supremacy, but a lot of these intersect with other forms of oppression that are experienced. So a lot of these show up, like paternalism shows up a ton in sexism. <laughs> um, you know, we see a lot of that. And a lot of this, um, trying to find like perfectionism can also be seen in religion. So I think a lot of these are really intersectional and we see them perpetuated across multiple different places. Um, and, and I think it's, I don't know, your perspective on like. Yeah, I mean, and I think too, traditionally, uh, religion has been used to oppress certain groups of people, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's based off of your interpretation of um, the written text that you are reading based off of your religion. But um, really understanding just the context that it's used in, right? Some people use religion in a way to motivate other people and show empathy and love. Other people use religion to demean people and put them down, you know? And so it's, it's to me, it's how you use something. Um, and oftentimes we can connect religion to this um, and in a way that it can be oppressive. I feel like the root of it is the idea of property and people. When Columbus came uh, to the Americas, it was in the pursuit of gold for the Spanish crown. And then later, the religion was used to justify, it. like, oh, we're going to we're going to fix these standards. Um, slavery existed before uh, before the, the advent of the United States, right? There was slavery all over the world. And I think, and I don't, my understanding is a lot of that was not because of different religious traditions necessarily, like it could have been tribal war and cultural differences perhaps, but ultimately it was the, the goal to gain the resources and access to resources in the land. 
So I think it boil. I think the root of everything, personally, is property. Yeah. Well, and I think the challenging part that I have found personally with equity is that, in my experience, you cannot live in black and gray either or. Um, that that you have to explore that there can be multiple truths at one time, there can be multiple roots at one time, that a lot of things can exist in conjunction with one another, which I think is really, really challenging sometimes for us to, to acknowledge. Like, we want to find the one thing, um, whether it's how to dismantle these and what's the one, one way to do it. Like, there is not one way or one right way. And how do we live in that? Is your hand up? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I, I was thinking about on a linguistic level, um, English after it, um, I think, I guess there's this um, uh, discourse um, prevailing in, in literary communities called uh, dis uh, dismantling uh, uh, colonialism in, in writing. Um, so one one example that I I would think of is like the title part of darkness, the word darkness, um, decolonization of language is what it's um, but always associating that with our language, like even when we talk about mental health issues, we're going we're talking about darkness, we're talking about the shadows and weird stuff. We're in, in, in Japanese culture, shadows and, and darkness is like a very like peaceful like thing to occur. Um, I was just wondering if that would fit in any of these poets. Um, I think or if it's if it if it would be a bullet or if it if it's a part, it is in a sense in America. Colonization is the white supremacy coming through our language. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one could argue that a lot of the decolonization work that's happening across multiple things, language, data, interpretation, um, is is sort of an antidote and a way in which we dismantle white supremacy, and a way in which we dismantle these cultural characteristics of white supremacy that continue to perpetuate. Um, so when you continue to associate, for example, like perfectionism to whiteness, or only one right way, um, there's only one right way to describe this, or only one right way to interpret this, um, that's how we perpetuate, right? You say this is this is the only way, um, instead of exploring that there there's greatness and multiple ways to interpret or to describe or reinterpret. Yeah, there's only right or wrong. Yeah, that's white supremacy. There's not just one way. There's multiple ways to do something, and I think we have to think about that. Um, so our last two slides. Um, I'll, yeah, this way. Okay, so for um, I did some strategies for DC Cares Coalition, but then also oh, for this look at that. Laws. Yeah, so <laughs> um, for you all, I was hoping you all could ask businesses and organizations to host like LGBT plus equity trainings. Um, disability justice training, anti-hate and anti-discrimination training um, for all new employees, make that a requirement. I think that's essential for everyone to go through. Um, I encourage everyone to read anti-racist, racial justice and social justice literature, because if you're not reading on a daily basis, you're not learning. So really committing yourself to doing the work daily. Um, hosting anti-racist um, circles, you know, based off of the literature that you're reading. I think that's important. Um, committing organizations or having businesses and organizations have in their mission statement, we commit to dismantling white supremacy, mm -hmm. which is hard. You know, who's at the table? I'm not sure all of you all can have conversations with your organization and ask people to commit to dismantling, you know, white supremacy. Or do you want to do anti racism work? Putting that in the mission statement. I think that's so important. Um, that's more aspirational, but at the bare minimum, right, providing employee resource groups, so those affinity groups for like um, BIPOC folks, um, for, for trans folks, people experiencing disabilities. Yeah. And some of the action steps are spaces and taken that I think can be replicated. And I think that's one of many because there's no right way. 
Um, but we have taken those culture characteristics and unpacked each one to talk about how is perfectionism showing up in our policies and systems? How are we reinforcing this specific component of white supremacy? And then identifying ways that we can change our policies and our systems within our focus of control. So within our branch or department um, where we work to actually start disrupting and, and, and putting in more interferences. And then uh, this is just kind of our call to action for comprehensive uh, human sexuality education. So based off of all the information that we've presented, um, comprehensive human sexuality education does a lot of this. And that's what we're trying to move towards and push for. Um, and we've shown, or we've seen that there's so many positive impacts this is looking for you, like improving dating, um, relationship skills, preventing child abuse, bullying, trauma, especially for LGBTQ plus folks, but also cisgender folks too. Um, and straight folks. Um, it really celebrates sexual diversity, reduces suicide ideation. Um, I think that's so important to take away. Um, really increasing social emotional learning, uh, addresses stigma, discrimination, and promotes better access to sexual health uh, care resources and care just for all communities of color. Yeah, and, and this is really pleading that sexual health has traditionally been racist because of the systems at play, right? Um, because of the system that we operate in, it's no brainer that it also will be racist. But with um, comprehensive human sexuality education, we're trying to be anti-racist and go against that. So really talking about the history of forced sterilization, coercion of birth control and emergency contraception, talking about LGBTQ plus relationships and um, monogamy, polyamory, different types of uh, relationships with different people. Uh, different attractions. I think that's important to articulate to um, our youth. Um, talking about consent, boundaries, and pleasure, um, not using shame or stigma, and really ensuring access to all contraception. Um, and something really important to this, to um, like, um, but we think a lot about, you know, we, someone who is looking at this presentation is like, why, why is it important to talk about the history? <laughs> um, but think about it if you're telling all of your young people, including BIPOC youth, that they should go and access all of this health care, but we just told you that historically they've been experimented on for sexual health marks, for example, contraceptives. Like, there's a disconnect. <laughs> like, we can tell people that there's those access, but are they going to use it? Because historically, it's been super harmful. Um, so, how do we acknowledge that and talk? Yeah, and my final slide is anti-racism work is not a checklist. So we've given you all a lot of strategies and opportunities, but it's not like, oh, I did all this, I'm anti-racist. No, 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 we're still operating in anti-racism on a daily basis, but you have to commit to these strategies daily and even push yourself to think outside the box. What do we not identify that you think is anti-racist that you could do within your business or organization? And we went right up to, and by right up, 830. Um, so totally appreciate you all have already given us two hours of your time to strike get there, but we're happy to stay around and ask questions whether it's individual or group. Asia, Danielle, also really want to acknowledge Amanda put so much work into creating this space here today. And also all of you, thank you so much for showing up and participating. I appreciate it so much. And I just want to also give one last plug to DC Cares. So this event tonight was put on, um, you know, it's okay. This, this is kind of silly at this point, but um, the Zoom. But yeah, DC Cares is a coalition that is growing in numbers all the time. And we have between 20 and 30 members at this point, And we have a lot of really committed people who want to implement these practices and these new kind of ways of thinking into their own organizations, businesses, lives, hopefully school districts. So if you're not a member and you would like to learn more or become a member, we have some postcards where you can go to our website. Um, and we're really excited to launch this coalition. I think we're gonna do really cool things all together in our county. And thanks again for attending, everyone. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, if anyone on Zoom has any questions, feel free to chime in on the chat. Otherwise, I think we're wrapping up because it's getting dark. Yeah. Um, okay. If you just share it with me and I'll share it with the list, I've got everybody's email. So we'll send the PowerPoint to everybody. And we can send some of our favorite links to That'd be awesome. Thanks. I want to turn your lights on and unplug this stuff, maybe. Okay. Let's see. We've got, I looked at chat. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in, Zoom friends. You're welcome, Jordan. Glad you could make it at the last minute, Jennifer. Thanks for tuning Thank in. You. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks for all your work yesterday. Yeah. Thanks for tonight. It was really good. Yeah. Sorry if you couldn't hear. I realized I was sitting next to the projector and that might have been like a humming sound. But it was just for a short period. It wasn't we're, for we're all gonna work out. Yeah, okay. We're going to up our game with the technology. <laughs> so, Sounds good. Okay, have a good night. Bye.